truth in that little song that we probably all learned. My mom tells me that that's the first song I ever sang in church. And I was three years old and I would get halfway through and I'd forget the words. And then she would tell me the words and I'd start over. <clears throat> and I did that about three times until I finally got through. But bask on those words. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And how do we know? Amen. The Apostle John writes these words. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written. He's talking about in the book, the Gospel of John. But these things have I written. So everything written in the book of John was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life eternal in his name. It's one of the few authors in Scripture that actually tells you why he wrote what he wrote. So when you're reading through the book of John, if you ever study through, through the book of John, that's why he wrote it. So everything focuses back on that. In the beginning was the Word, right? The Word was with God and the Word was God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And at one point I hope, one point I hope that he became real to you to the point that you've surrendered your life to him. 
Be seated, please, as the choir shares a song. And JB's going to sing the solo. It's called We Will Remember. And I think that it's important that we remember the great things that the Lord Jesus has done in our life. Amen.
love that song. I love the message. I love the, the, the truth that after Christ has come into someone's life, he cleans them up. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and I asked them, I said, do you wash your hands before you get in the shower? They said, no. And I said, that's life with Jesus. <laughs> you come to the Lord just as you are, and he cleans you up. He changes us. And uh, what a joy it is to testify of that truth and that reality here with you today. Uh, let's go to the Lord and let's pray. Father, uh, thank you. Thank you that you have provided a way for us to uh, not be the sum of our mistakes and our failures and our shame, but instead to be something so much more, to be seen by you with the perfection of Christ and his righteousness that has been imputed on us, not because we deserve that, but because out of your great love and your great affection, you have freely given that, that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, and that righteousness is Christ Jesus. And salvation comes as a free gift through him. So thank you for that unbelievable reality. To come in here this morning, united in that truth, to say that whatever's going on in the world around us, we will gather here in this moment to thank you for the cross and the empty tomb and the spirit that now moves amongst us. And so I pray in the vein of what we've just sung that we would not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. And that's why we gather in here this morning. We gather here to, to hear from the ultimate truth of the universe that there is a holy God worthy of all power and all glory and all honor that we could give him. And we do not always do that. That's the hard part. That's the dissonance in our mind that we come in here feeling unworthy. And, and that's the truth. As Satan accuses us and tells us that we are unworthy, we are. And yet, that is not the charge you hold against us. That is your great delight to look at your people gathered here and in other churches across our community and across our region, our world, and say, I have redeemed them, I have called them by name, I have brought them through the fire and they are mine. That they have been bought with a price. And so would we live according to the standard and the calling that you have called us to? when you delivered us from the domain of darkness and into your marvelous light. So would we be the people of light, that our lives would be centered on hope and mercy and grace, and that we would show that to those around us because we know who we've been and we know who we are in Christ. So help us to taste and see that the Lord is good this morning. That is hard right now for some of us in the room who have lost loved ones in recent days who have tough physical battles ahead of them. And I pray for unbelievable grace, tangible grace through your people and through family and friends that, that grief would happen but not grief without hope. And that struggle and trials would happen but not, not without the presence of God's spirit and God's people around them. And I pray for those that have a lot of changes coming up, that there will be graduation and, and, and people will be moving and, and their families will be uh, changed up by marriages and, and births. And when these things happen, God, they are gifts from you, naturally occurring things in this great design you have put forward in this world. So would we celebrate those? Would we nurture and protect those commitments as new life is brought forth as new unions are made and covenant vows exchanged. Would you bless those? Would you strengthen the marriages and the vows that were taken years ago within this room right now? God, it is an honor to live in your world that in spite of all of the sin that we have committed and that others have committed against us and, and just a naturally occurring world that hurts, that we still can look at the sun that came up this morning. And that is a grace. So I pray that out of the overflow of our hearts, our mouths would speak this morning that God is good. So would we give you the appropriate honor right now? Thank you for that goodness. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand.
Scripture tells us that the one that was perfect, the one that had no sin in his life, stepped out of heaven and came to this earth and took all the sin that you and I have committed, all those sins that you and I will commit for one purpose, that's so that we could have eternal life. Don't be in bondage to sin that you committed and that you've asked for forgiveness over. Don't do that because that's all been covered in the blood of Jesus. Live in victory today. That was one of the, the things that Kevin, the guy that was speaking, told us. And sometimes when you, you hear somebody that just tells you in, in very graphic terms of the things that he did and they survived because we have a creator that loves us and a savior that said, listen, I took care of that on the cross. Understand that there's no sin that you've committed that he cannot cover and hasn't already covered. The key is, are you one of his children? And is that blood applicable to you? I want you to sing this song and I pray that this is the heartbeat of who you are. Amen. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and he carried the cross love so Amen. Mm-hmm. 
thank you that the words of that song are true because the Bible tells us they're true that you are the Lord of everything and that you created everything for your glory and for some reason you've placed us right in the middle of it and even though we messed it up you gave us a way to be reunited with the Father and Lord we thank you for the blood of Jesus Lord, today as Brother Carter comes to share this text, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that is bound under the circumstance of their sin, Lord, that you would do the work of freeing them of that today. If they've never made a profession of faith for you, never trusted you, Lord, I pray that you would do the work of salvation so they could pass from death unto life. Lord, you can do that, and we ask you to do that. We love you, Lord. We pray. And under we have all this in the name of Jesus who saves. Amen. Be seated, please. My son Rex, uh, he came home from the family conference the other night telling me that he could punch the devil in the face. <laughs> it's a good lesson to learn. <laughs> I, I commended him. I said, have at it. Holy Ghost punch. It's always a good thing. Uh, so last week, uh, we uh, spent some time talking about God's goodness in this life. Uh, that God's people will see his goodness in the land of the living. Uh, and, and so we've been marching through Genesis uh, for some time now, looking at God's providence, how he brings people from point A to point B for his sovereign purposes. And that's not always an enjoyable experience. Uh, it's not always a fun one. That at times, some people uh, may sin against us. And sometimes we sin, and, and it messes up what we think is God's plan. But he, in his divine foreknowledge, can work all things together, even evil, for the ultimate good. So God is, does not cause evil. He does not cause people to sin, but that he can use those things in our lives to create something incredible. Uh, and so we've been doing this journey of, of these men and women along the Genesis storyline, and, and we're finally nearing the end Last week, we talked about Jacob seeing his son, who he thought was dead, and they had this beautiful uh, reunion, and, and, and so we talked about God's goodness there. Uh, and so what's next? How is this plain land in this story? Well, back in Genesis 12, when God told Abram, when he first called him forward, he told Abram to leave his homeland, that he was going to make him into a great nation, that he would be blessed. And and so you have this expectation in your mind. I'm sure Abraham did to some extent that, okay, blessing, great nation. That means that I'm going to have a lot of family members and, and I'm going to have a, a huge uh, uh, possessions and, and I'm going to be wealthy and everything's going to be great. That, that may have been his expectation. Uh, and that certainly probably is ours when we think of a good life, that, that things will be well for us. And here we are. His family is only about 70 able-bodied men a few hundred years after the fact. They have been wandering around. They don't own much land. They don't have tons of possessions. And they are seeking refuge in Egypt of all places. And they seem a little down and out. I was driving the other day, uh, and I, you know how when you drive, your mind just wanders and was having a moment of just grief and, and just thinking through some people I've lost in my life and, and was just kind of processing all that. You guys know how grief is. You don't really pick and choose when it pops up. It just kind of rears its head in appropriate times and, and sometimes inappropriate ones. Uh, but either way, uh, I'm just kind of thinking through that. And my kids, we do 
uh, a, a catechism with our kids, and that's going to flare up some bad memories for some of you. <laughs> uh, but but it, it's just a short question and answer. If you grew up Southern Baptist, you probably don't know what this is. Uh, it's a short question and answer format that just kind of teaches the fundamentals of the faith. There's several of them out there, and, and, and most of them good. Uh, and so we do one with our kids, and there's an accompanying soundtrack to that. Uh, so you can teach them just these simple little kids' songs and kind of uh, their questions, and then one or two answer statements that sum up those questions. In question number one, and they take this from uh, 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 the Heidelberg Catechism, written in the 1500s, and we're going to learn question one here in a minute. Uh, and, and, and so the question is, what is our only hope in life and death? And, and in the kids' version, the answer is, our hope, all right, the answer to that question is that we are not our own, we belong to God. And so I'm sitting here driving, having this moment of grief, having this moment of sorrow, and what comes across my shuffle on my, uh, my phone, because, right, I've got kids, and, and grown-up music doesn't come across anymore. It's all, uh, it's all kids stuff. Uh, and, and what pops up but the song, what is our only hope in life and death? And I sang at the top of my lungs that we are not our own we belong to God. Now, it doesn't make the sadness go away. Didn't resurrect anybody on the spot. <laughs> but it was enough. It was enough. It was enough that that was my hope, is that I and you and we and all of us who claim the name of Christ belong to God, and he is sovereign on the throne. Because the reality is our lives will have ups and downs and things that seem like failure that actually aren't and things that seem like success that may not actually be what it was all chalked up to be and in and, and the accompanied stress and anxieties of life. And, and so you may be sitting out here wondering, what is the purpose? What is the point of all of this? Well, 2 Corinthians 4.16 lays it out clearly. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So the main idea of today's message is simply this, Christ is our only hope in life and death. I think that that is a truth you can walk away with, you can stake your life on. If you get nothing else from today, if you can know that and know that deep in your bones, uh, you will be set up for not only tomorrow, but for eternity. Jacob, uh, in the scene we're about to approach, you may look disheveled and a travel-weary old man. His family may look like they are headed for slavery. This famine is raging around, but something glorious is being prepared for them. And you may be in the same place. As we saw last week, God is good now and forevermore. He's preparing something incredible for us. And that may not happen on this side of eternity. I make no promises. I think you will see God's goodness in the land of the living, but his best, his ultimate for us is going to happen when Christ returns and institutes his kingdom forevermore. All right, so first thing to stake our hope on that Christ is our only hope in life and death is to know that God is sovereign over the nations. Uh, I don't know if I told you to turn to Genesis 47, but if you're not there yet, uh, flip quickly. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And now, please, let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. And then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, 
The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few in evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And then Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land, in the land of Remesis, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brother, and all his father's household with food according to the number of their dependents. So, in the text we covered last week, Joseph got his brothers together. He moved them into this land of Goshen. It's, it's a considerable distance away from the Egyptian capital. Uh, and it's kind of set off to the side. And so we mentioned this was to kind of institute a protective holiness, to keep God's people kind of separate from mainstream Egypt. They didn't want to, to walk away looking like Egyptians, all right? They needed to walk away looking like Israelites. They needed to be the, God, the people that God had called them to be. And so Jacob or Joseph, rather, knows, hey, there's good land here. We can move into that land, and, and Pharaoh will be more than happy for us to, to stay there. Uh, and so he coaches them up on, on kind of how to say all this. They come before Pharaoh. They make their case, and, and, and Pharaoh is happy to oblige. Notice their phrasing here. They say, we're here together, our father, our brothers. This family has been disunified their entire existence. And yet here in this moment, in this sojourning, in this hard moment, but with famine raging all around them, now all of a sudden they are in lockstep with one, an, one another, in solidarity. And so then they say, we're just resident aliens here. We're sojourners. We are not hanging out here for the rest of our lives. That we didn't come here planning to, to build houses for eternity. We came here because we anticipate leaving soon enough. And then finally they say, we're your servants. We are... No threat to your empire here. And so they request to settle in Goshen. Pharaoh happily grants it. And you see, once again, a resurrected son saving his family. What does that remind you of? Pharaoh even puts them in charge of his livestock. He makes them official administrators in the land of Egypt. And so they're receiving honor here. And so this Genesis 15 prophecy, we read it last week where, where God visits Abraham again and he tells them, know for certain that your people, your family are going to be servants in a land that is not their own. He says they're going to be enslaved even. And that is being fulfilled in this moment. That this time is not random chance. This isn't coincidence. This isn't the right place at the right time. That this is a sovereign God playing things out exactly as he wills. So whatever details seem awry in your life, I don't think God causes all those. Like I said earlier, he doesn't make people to sin. But know for certain that God is not absent from those, that he does not uh, grow weary of having to figure the things out in your life and the twists and turns. He can do that. He rejoices in doing that, that all things must work together for the good of those that love God. But here's the part I love most about this text. Jacob walks in before Pharaoh. And I don't know why, this may be an unfair, but I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Uh, I kind of imagine Jacob looking like Jed Clampett. I don't know. It just, uh, he's kind of a, he's in, he's in Canaan, man. He's a shepherd in Canaan. Kind of a redneck. Maybe a, Canaan had a lot of hills. I guess he'd technically be a hillbilly. There's a difference. I've lived in East Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> And so he comes in to, in before Pharaoh, this is the most powerful man in the known world. And I just picture Jacob has, is road weary, he's getting older in age, and as he says from his own mouth, my, my years have been evil, my days have been hard. And, and, and you just picture in your mind Pharaoh in his fancy palace on his throne with, with guards and chariots and horses and all the power in the world and stands before him probably a, a smaller man who's wrestled with God, who limps, who, who is physically broken in a lot of ways, and, and he stands before him. But what happens? Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Now, the reason that's odd, and, and we've covered this a long time ago when we talked about Melchizedek, uh, in the ancient world, the more powerful figure blesses the lesser. 
Like you got to have something to bless the other with in that moment. Think about Jesus on the road to Emmaus when he meets the two disciples. And those two disciples don't know who he is, right? He's kind of hidden his identity. And they gather together to break bread. And the owner of the household, the head of the household, would be the one that takes the bread, blesses it, and breaks it. But in that moment, Jesus does that. It would have been a humongous social faux pas. He should not have done that. And yet what he is saying there is, you can't bless me. I bless you. That I'm the authority. And remember, he breaks the bread, and what happens? Their eyes are open, and they recognize that it is Jesus. Well, in this moment, Jacob, looking like he's got nothing to his name, uh, just seems helpless before this most powerful man in the world, looks at him and says, yes, you've got an army. Yes, you've got chariots. Yes, you've got land. I have the breather of stars on my side, that I have met with the sovereign God of the universe in my dreams, and he has told me that he has a plan for me, that the one who curbs oceans and puts them where they need to go, who who says the, the hills will rise here, the mountains there, that that God knows me by name and is with me in this moment. So no, Pharaoh, you don't bless Jacob. Jacob blesses you. What does that say to you today? of our worldly thoughts of power and and status and goodness, of everything that you think must be right in your life for it to matter, what does God say about you? If you are in Christ, the truth is you have more than anything else you would ever need. That just as Abram knew, I've got a covenant promise, you and I so too have a covenant promise And so just as Jacob can stand before the most powerful man in the world, you and I right now gathered in this room sit underneath the most powerful man in the universe who is seated at the right hand of the Father this very instant. And his spirit is here with us. So if the new king of England walked in this room right now, or the president or Warren Buffett himself, guess what? They have nothing to offer us that we would be respectful to them, I'm sure, but they can take a seat alongside of us and praise at the feet of Jesus, the most high king of the universe. I would then direct them to our building fund and let them know that it is always open. But at the end of the day, they cannot offer us anything. We have everything to offer them. Just as Jacob stands before him, he may seem weak. He may seem out of it. He may seem like he doesn't have a penny to his name. He has everything everything. And so this travel-hardened man, he holds the court. And Pharaoh says, how old are you? What's your life been like? He says, few and evil have been the days. Jacob was a pretty morose dude. He's a pretty kind of depressed spirit. And yet he is still the superior one in this duo. How does that happen? 1 Corinthians 1, 26 tells us this, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And this should come as no surprise to us. That's our testimony You're sitting in here today a weak and foolish person. (laughs) I just want to gash you up for a minute. Uh, That should come as no surprise. This is our confession. That I have sinned. I have have transgressed this holy God. I am dead in my sins and trespasses. But in Christ, I have been raised to new life. So I submit to him. And that Christ that we submit to, what was prophesied of this Christ in Isaiah 53? That he was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. There's nothing esteemable about him. We despised and rejected him. So for us in here right now, we may seem transient in this world. It may seem like you don't have a lot to your name or your world is falling apart or you're frustrated or wickedness is winning or your anxiety is through the roof or, or, or pain has happened in your life. So few and miserable may be the years of our lives, but know this, the covenant that Jacob so treasured and allowed him to bestow blessing on Pharaoh, we have something even better. 
that we have the person and the work of Jesus Christ and his atoning death on a cross for us and a resurrection that resurrects us to new life as well. I just pictured Jesus before Pilate in that scene of Jesus silent before him and Pilate's looking at him like, come on, man, say something. I can save you, but you gotta perform for me. You gotta give me something here. I'm the most powerful man in this room. Not knowing that the atoms in his body are held together by the very breath in Jesus' lungs. And so who really is the most powerful one in that room? You and I have that within us. That's your testimony. That's who lives within you. So whatever the world might say, know this, God is sovereign over the world, and he is within you, and he's placed you where you are in the circumstances that you're currently in for his glory and to ultimately work it out for your good. All right, second part, God blesses the nations. Part of Abraham's covenant with God was that whatever nation would bless Abraham, uh, they would also be blessed, and we see that playing out here. Now, I'm not going to read all of it. Here's the gist. Um, The people run out of money. There's a famine. They've been coming to Joseph and buying food for five or six years now, and and so they've run out of money, and they tell Joseph, we're all going to die. And whenever the rain starts falling again, this earth is going to be desolate. And so you got to give us something here, man. And Joseph says, okay, give me all of your livestock. And so they trade all their livestock in, they get food, and then a few seasons pass, and that runs out. And so they come back to him, and they say, we don't have money, we don't have livestock, we have the ground that we stand on. And Joseph says, I'll take that. (laughs) And so what happens here is a sort of Egyptian... Communism. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was trying to trigger your mind. I was trying, if, you were, if you were not listening, now you are, okay? Uh, it's not that. What happens here is, is that they come to, to Joseph and they say, look, we understand that we need to work to earn something to survive off of. They know the value of work. They know that they, it is fair to, to earn your wage. And and, and so they voluntarily enter into this agreement. They're the ones who dream it up for Joseph. They're the ones who say to do it. Furthermore, uh, they don't take their land from them forcibly, uh, but instead the, 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 the people voluntarily say, we'll do this, we'll enter into servitude because that means that we will have life and that's better than death. Joseph graciously says, okay, you guys keep 80%. You give 20 to Pharaoh, which is uh, by contemporary standards of the day that was extremely generous. Um, And so all in all, what this is, this is God orchestrating a way for these people to continue to survive. And he's doing it through the administrative gifts of Joseph. And lastly, you know that this is okay because Genesis 47, 25 says this, and they said, you have saved our lives. May it please my Lord, we will be servants to Pharaoh. So they're happily entering into this arrangement. Rather than let this entire nation die, God, through Joseph, preserves life. And in the process, he's personally blessing Pharaoh and building him up as well. And Pharaoh seems to have been a worthy and effective king, fair and hospitable and gracious. You think about Jesus in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us, God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the just, and he causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. God loves the nations. God loves people outside of his people. He desires that none should perish. All of us, prior to our life in Christ, were Egyptians in this story. We need rescue, and we need rescue from from God. And so God is doing that. He's providing a way for the nations to be saved. God's heart has always been to preserve life, always. And so may we too feel about those outside of God's people Uh, like God does. And may we love them just like God does. But I think the whole point of this is to show that God is blessing these people, but he is blessing his covenant people still the same. God blesses his people. Verse 27, thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147 years. Years. So notice the comparison of what's happening here. 
that as the Egyptians are surviving and God is making a way for them to survive and, and, and continue on in their lives, he is simultaneously blessing and increasing his people. That in the midst of a famine, they are gaining in possessions and in land. So you see what's going on here. They are flourishing. He's made a way for them to grow no matter the circumstances around them. There's no security net here. There's no GoFundMe pages uh, for these people. They've got nothing. And yet God is graciously allowing them to thrive. It's a huge point in the story. It's a huge point in the story for them because it's going to set the, the, the table for their eventual exodus from Genesis. But it tells us that regardless of what's swirling on in the world, God's people are secure. Famine, we'll have enough food. We'll get by. Sojourners, no homeland, we'll have room. God will make a way for us. That's us. That is our story, that we are resident aliens here below in a wasteland. And yet God, through his son, his spirit, his word, and his people has provided everything that we need for life and godliness. Ephesians 1 tells us that in Christ, he has blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly realm. That everything you need to be an obedient, loving, thriving follower of Jesus has been made available to you. We watched a, a video yesterday at our family conference, uh, and one of the guys who spoke, Paul David Tripp, he, he says this, if God brings you to the edge of a sea and he tells you to cross it, he will either build a bridge, send a boat, give you the ability to swim, or split it wide open. But either way, whatever God brings you to, he will provide the grace for you to get through it. What God has brought you to, he will get you through. If you want to hear more about God's goodness and his blessing, someone preached like a 45-minute sermon about it last week. Uh, you can go check that out. Um, but it is very real and very evident in this story. And so know this. Whatever circumstances may seem like a hindrance to your spiritual journey are actually the things that will allow you to grow and thrive. What you see as an obstacle is what God sees as a mechanism for your growth and maturity. And lastly, God will resurrect his people. God will resurrect his people. Genesis 47, read this, starting in verse 29. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. And then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. So Jacob, like four times already, has said, I'm going to die. And now he actually is dying. <laughs> like it's finally caught up to him. Um, and he calls Joseph to himself. And, and he basically makes him Old Testament pinky promise that he will take him back to Canaan. And if that wasn't enough, as we've all been, you know, preteens or kids or whatever, and you said, cross your heart, hope to die, stick a needle in your eye. That's what, that's what Jacob is holding Joseph to. You cannot let me be buried here in Egypt. Take me back to Canaan. Well, why does he feel this strongly about that? Why does he want to be in Canaan so badly? Well, what it does is it shows a rigorous, intense belief that God is going to make good on his covenant promises, that he is going to bring his people out of Egypt. You remember when Jacob is sojourning, he's about to leave Canaan, and he offers a sacrifice in Beersheba, and God says, go down, I'm with you, I'm going to bring you back. And so what this shows is a faith that Jacob has, that one day, whether it be 10 years from now when the famine is over, or as it actually played out 400 years later, one day, my people will be back in the promised land. That's where I need to be. Bury me there. And so his hope was no longer that he was going to become some sort of king, some sort of ruler, that he would be the richest man in the world. Jacob was once a liar, a deceiver, a double crosser. He was egotistical. He was favoritist, favoristic towards his kids. He was a bad husband. He was a bad father. And here at the end of his life, he's making a count. Here at the end, he knows where his hope needs to be found. It's not in his flocks. It's not in his wealth. It's not in his wife. It's not in his kids. It's not in his homeland. His hope is in God. And the coolest part about this 
is even at this moment, the only real land that this family owns in the promised land was a burial cave that Abraham bought for Sarah generations ago. Now, is there not a, a beauty to that? That their hope is in the grave, and that one day they will come out of the grave. Do you see where we're going with this? Do you see the seeds of resurrection that are being planted here? That this family says, you know what? I'm sojourning here below. I'm following the Lord. And it's not playing out like I hoped it will, but somehow, some way, when God comes and makes all things new again, I don't know what it'll look like, but I need to be in the promised land. That I will be resurrected out of the grave. Many of you have probably uh, studied, heard sermons on Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. And remember what God says to Ezekiel there, prophesy, say that I'm going to breathe over these bones and one day they will live again, bring these bones to life. And is that not fitting that Jacob's hope was a tomb that would open up and God's power would raise him to new life? And those few and evil years down below would pale in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that Jacob was going to see. So today, where is your hope? Is it that all things are going to play out here and now? That all things are going to, are going to be okay here below? That maybe you can carve out, you know, the average lifespan is somewhere in your 70s. Is that your hope? I can have 70-something good years here below. Hopefully 80, maybe 90, maybe 100. My great aunt Jenny said that was a good stopping off place. <laughs> if that's all it is, it's not going to deliver. If it's that your job is going to be every single thing you ever hoped it would be, it will not deliver. If it's going to be that your spouse, your relationships, your friendships, your kids are always going to deliver happiness to you, they will not do so. But if your hope is that all the sadness and all the grief and all the sorrow of this world, all the ways that things don't measure up will one day be undone when Christ returns. When he comes in victory, that this world will no longer be fooled around with momentary pleasure, but instead we will look to the king of kings and glorify his great name and know that it was all worth it. Every momentary pleasure you may have missed out on here below, every grief you ever felt, every tear you ever cried, every heartache you ever went through, every physical ailment you ever had, you will not think of any of that. But instead, you will worship at the feet of a resurrected Savior. Now, Jacob didn't have all that squarely in his mind. He wouldn't have been able to say, oh yeah, this is how it's all going to happen. He just knew God has made a covenant, and God is faithful to that covenant. I don't know what all it's going to look like, but it will play out well for us. I pray today that that would be your hope. That your hope would not be that you can pull it all together, that you can just get enough discipline to make your life worthwhile, or that maybe one day, hoping against hope, that things will come together for you. I can't guarantee that. What I can guarantee is that Christ is no longer in the grave. I can guarantee that one day he will return because everything he ever said he was going to do, everything he promised in the scriptures, he has done. God has sworn against himself and God cannot lie. So where is our hope? Our hope is in Christ declaring that all things will be made new through him. So you may feel like Jacob before Pharaoh right now. Few and miserable may have been your years, but know this, in your living and in your dying, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you ready to learn a catechism? Question number one. Some of you in here are like, absolutely not. I'm not learning this. That's okay. Uh, there's, no, there's no test. Uh, here, here it goes, okay? The question is this. Question number one of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and death? And this is the full answer. That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him.